for us. Awesome. So Stephanie, I'm super curious, you know, this is about metrics and you have always led your teams with a metrics based approach and done a great job educating up down and sideways with metrics i would love to know um what are your favorite metrics and why um well there's so many different things that you can look at and once you have some time and um, working on a team you start to accumulate all this data and i feel like my favorite metrics kind of shift through the seasons one of my favorite ones right now is this one that's on here that you can pull in like a workflow you can um, get a sense for how your stakeholders are submitting their feedback by looking in your reviews at reviewer in invited, reviewer opened, and reviewer submitted their feedback on your proof, um, which can be really helpful just to get a better idea of how those stakeholders are actually engaging with the proofs that you send for feedback. Nice. So you're sort of thinking those essentially as a funnel. How many people did we invite? How many people opened them? How many people submitted? So that then, not to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like this helps you ensure that stakeholders are actually engaging and communicating with the team, right? Yeah, absolutely. It does help show engagement. It's more of like a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You get to like get a gl glimpse of engagement that way, which is really cool. Super cool. I mean, for me, the ones that I, I care about them all because I do love metrics, but I'm interested in overall review duration because it gives a sense of, you know, are things moving through the, the machine as it were quickly and volume of deliverables shared because that just gives us a sense of how productive the team is. So those are my two favorites, but you know, you have a lot more thoughtful takes that we will explore as we, as we dive in. Uh, today, we're going to walk through just a few things. We'll talk briefly about what creative operations is and what LITHO is. We'll talk about the metrics and the building blocks for a metric framework. We'll talk about metrics measuring outcomes. We'll talk about metrics measuring inputs. And then the really important question is now what? What are we going to do with all this information? So I'm going to jump in real quickly with an overview of the discipline of creative operations, what a creative operations platform is. We've often talked in terms of the, the creative life cycle, what it takes to go from a, you know, a request or an idea for a deliverable to final deliverables being used, accessed by the right people, et cetera. There's several different ways to think about it, but this is a simple way of thinking it with four building blocks. You need to manage the creation. How do you get ideas in? How do you get work collaborated on? You have to have a universal approval concept, which when we say universal approval, approvals are hard and routing approvals is you know, perhaps one of the hardest things to keep an operation running efficiently. You need to automate many of your repetitive tasks. And then additionally, as, you, as we create assets, we need to share them with the right people in the field ensure that they're getting the right version of the asset, using it in the right way at the right time. But all of those four steps in bringing content assets to market lie on two things. Integrations is one, of course, because you need to plug in with other areas of your stack. But then also most importantly, and really the topic of today's webinar is insights and industry expertise, because the insights come from metrics. And of course, the expertise comes from folks like Stephanie that are from the industry and that work directly with your teams. So, you know, when you think about Stephanie, and you were actually an early adopter of the concept of creative operations when we first talked, what are the benefits of thinking in that way rather than thinking in perhaps a more siloed project management or asset management way? Yeah, so when you sort of mature as um, a marketing unit and have more thought around creative operations, you really do start to have um, one system of record for, um, for not just like your assets, but also for your data to be able to understand what's actually happening in your, um, in your department, to be able to study those things um, through um, a central hub for your teams. You can have um, greater visibility into the overall creative life cycle, like you were just mentioning, um, from the very beginning of a, an idea to how it's actually executed. Um, um, one thing that I have found is that, like, as uh, marketing teams do mature, um, this creative operations becomes more and more important 
that's one thing as a, um, a previous customer of Litho that I really appreciated our um, customer success managers that we worked with at Litho to help us mature. They would ask us questions and through those questions and conversations, um, our own marketing teams develop new processes and um, new ways of working more efficiently and effectively. Nice. So I'm, you know, sort of curious, moving on to sort of the next step, looking at sort of a metric framework. And this comes this comes out of the work of that CX team that you just mentioned as they work with our customers. But I noticed that we've sort of, in addition to having metrics for the various stages of creative operations, we've also got subset into impact metrics and lagging outcome or team motivator metrics. What are the differences between those two types of metrics to you, Stephanie, and how do you use each differently? Yeah, no, I love this because there are there's so much data that we can look at and it can become overwhelming. Um, this slide here that you've got up here it helps us kind of differentiate the two different ways of thinking about um, all the data we have available and the metrics we can look at. So impact metrics, that's more forward looking. And this is something that the senior leadership teams on marketing departments tend to care about more, um, like that time to first proof um, that we see there under the creation management column, that very first one, that can be a really helpful way for um, the senior leadership team to know how long stakeholders are um, taking to see their ideas go from a creative brief to that stakeholder being able to see a, a first proof of what they had in mind. So it's sort of a forecast of how quickly we can turn things around um, as opposed to the lagging outcomes. And those are more metrics that are just as valuable, but they're more of like looking at things in the rear view mirror um, to see how, um, how many projects we did complete, how many requests we completed, um, and also like how many num like the number of projects we completed on time. And again, in that first column there, these are really great metrics to use to motivate your team. Um, and both different, both, both kinds of metrics, whether they're impact metrics, forward looking or lagging outcomes, like rear view looking, they're both just as important, but they kind of have different purposes. Well, and they have different audiences, right? I mean, one taxonomy is impact metrics are how are we doing and lagging outcomes are how did we do? But more to the point, I think what I hear when you talk in Stephanie, you have sort of an executive audience often for the impact metrics and then perhaps a team audience managing the team for the for the outcome metrics. Tell me, um, when you, you probably have to educate your leadership, don't you, on what these mean and why they should care about them? Absolutely. Um, the teams that I've worked on before, they're like we've talked about, there's so many different kinds of metrics for you to look at and um, the different, I guess, like, layers of people who um, those matter to you, like it kind of varies. So the, the people who are working on the ground, they might have different um, metrics that are more relevant to them as opposed to middle management, as opposed to senior leadership. So when you're thinking about communicating up to senior leadership, you do have to um, be a really good listener to understand what their pain points are to then figure out which of these metrics you want to send up to them because they have limited time, They've got um, everything is just much more magnified for them. They have that sort of like 5,000 foot view of everything. So you don't want to bother them with the minutia that's on the ground. And so in order to um, clearly communicate to them um, what the data is that they're seeing, there is some education that needs to go into that. Um, and just I think a lot of that also comes down to listening very closely to what senior leadership really cares about. Um, I'll just pause there. I could keep I could keep talking about that, but I'll just pause for a second. No, it makes sense. You need to understand what their concerns are and then use the metrics to answer those questions is essentially what you're saying, which makes great, great sense to me. Because when we think about what you know senior leadership often cares about, they do care about outcomes, right? And our North Star as a company is to help customers, you know, achieve achieve better better content outcomes. So I'm curious to know. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about how you engage with senior leadership on this. If you need to educate them on the value of perhaps knowing the volume of deliverables shared or on-time completion, how do you convey that as you work with them? 
it takes a lot of effort to um, like just distill that down to something that's going to be very simple to understand. This is one of those concepts. There's this phrase that I love that I mentioned a lot that um, good design is 99% invisible. Um, in order to produce a good product, it has to look effortless, but there's a lot of effort that goes into that. When you're communicating with your senior leadership team, you want to put a lot of effort into distilling your communication with them into very like simple, easy to, to get um, concepts. Not that they can't understand com complexity, but um, you want to be respectful of their time and make it easy for them to um, buy into. Which puts you a bit in a chief simplifier role in terms of explaining them, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not, like I said, it's not like they can't handle something that's more complex, but um, they're just, you know, they've got that more like 5,000 foot perspective. Sure. And so with that in mind, you know, I recall when you were a practitioner in the field, one of your big successes was taking a team that had a track record of, you know, often, you know, many deliverables not hitting the date. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, through management, through your metrics driven approach, you shaped that team up to where you had a very high measure of compliance for things were done within the, you know, sort of the estimated time and you were running a very tight ship. Uh, what metrics did you use as you worked on solving that problem? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Russ. Um, I get really excited talking about this. But I know um, you do. <laughs> um, when we were working on that particular um, project, we, um, the people on my team, we were looking at so many different kinds of metrics. We were measuring specifically um, our turnaround time because there was this general sense that we were not delivering our projects on time, um, but it was an intangible sort of like feeling. And so the first thing that we did is we started running reports um, using like the workflow to see how we had delivered on time um, for all of our projects, quarter by quarter, year over year. Then we broke it out by specific teams. Then we looked specifically at individuals. We looked at different kinds of materials. We looked at all these different numbers um, mm -hmm. as a team before taking it to senior leadership. And we thought very carefully about what is the, the message that we want to communicate? What do we want our goal to be for this? Because we were finding that we were um, indeed not delivering on time consistently and we saw the numbers. And so that helped give us a little bit more uh, of a concrete message to then be able to re respond to. We helped to find a problem. And that was the first thing that um, the metrics really helped us do is to define the, this, the problem that we we're trying to solve. So once we have that, we then um, took it and tried to simplify it. Like what is a team goal that we could all focus on together that would take into account um, the different needs of the content group versus the digital group versus the creative group. Um, we had a lot of different kinds of work. So we distilled it down to like as a, a marketing department, we wanted to deliver X number of projects on time during a, a specific period. So we were very specific and time oriented in our goal. And we took that to our senior leadership. And so we were able to listen to our senior leadership, find out what um, their um, concerns were, which were like those intangible feelings of I feel like we're not delivering on time. We're able to define that and then um, create a, a challenge for ourselves to then measure ourselves against during a certain time period. Nice. And what's and an interesting thing about that when you mention, you know, a general feeling that we were often not delivering on time, what I personally find metrics really powerful for is, you know, first off, validating or refuting that, but secondly, making it quantifiable because people in their minds go, this team never delivers or delivers on time, or this team always does this. And when you can say no, in point of fact, at 73.2% of the time, suddenly you're having a much better conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, having then those longitudinal like data points where we can kind of compare, like, how do we do during this period versus that period, then we can see more of a relationship between those sort of data points and it gives us more context for the overall story um that's really what the data is good for us helping us tell a story 
And you used a word there that I want to make sure we explore, longitudinal. Tell me what that means and why you look at data longitudinally. So what that is talking about is it's not just like one particular data point at um, like November, like 2022. It's looking at over a period of time, how have we done, like, uh, what is the relationship between those different data points? So um, an example might be a quarter over quarter or year over year. How do we do um, during this one period from say like like quarter three in 2022 versus quarter three 2021? And that helps us then tell the story. Um, it's interesting to see like another period that might be interesting is seeing how things changed over 2020 and to kind of understand how the pandemic affected people. Mm -hmm. Again, it's all about like the data is all there just to help us tell stories. Yeah, it helps you tell a story and it helps you understand the context. I love that. We've talked a little bit about outcomes, but I'm also curious about inputs. And there's a full disclosure, there's a book I read and several of us have read called Working Backwards about how Amazon works. And the striking thing about their framework is they worry a lot more about what they call controllable inputs, meaning, you know, yes, you want to measure the outcome. For example, you want to hit a sales goal, but you cannot directly affect hitting the sales goal by staring at the number. You've got to ask what actions are we taking? Are we making phone calls? Are we doing email outreach? Are we doing marketing? Whatever it might be, right? And so tell me how you think about inputs when you're working with a customer or in your role leading a creative team. Yeah, I mean, just like what you said, um, there are the things that kind of help us predict how things um, are going to like what our outcomes are going to look like, right? And I love that we have some actual concrete examples of reports that people can um, look at in Litho. The uh, number of reviews, for example, that we have on this slide can be a really interesting indicator of um, how long, like how how great of a outcome we're going to get from that particular project. If you're seeing um, number of reviews on a certain piece edge up to like, I don't know, like 15 versions or something, that might indicate that the um, original content wasn't solidified before going to create it. There, I mean, it's just a red flag. Um, so I, I love that we have these examples on here of things that um, creative teams could actually be looking at right now to understand um, the the quality i guess of their inputs um these are the things that we can that we've got like the levers to be able to pull perhaps to um to then change our uh, our the quality of our outputs so uh, I, and from what you said it almost sounds like the metrics are the metrics are a vital sign but not a diagnosis right <laughs> um and so using the using that example that you just used number of reviews you can tell things are perhaps going off the rails when you have a radically increasing number of review versions if i'm a customer and i come to you stephanie and i say i don't know what ha what's happening but increasingly i'm finding that rather than two or three reviews review versions we are ending up with four five six or more it seems to me that's a problem that's wasted time what should i do about that stephanie yeah, no, I think it's great that they've got that sort of sense and um, that they can see those sorts of numbers to validate their suspicions. Like you were just saying earlier, it can either like validate or it can invalidate a feeling that you have. Like the data helps you kind of um, inform those sorts of suspicions. Once you have that information, you could go into the individual projects to see where things might have fallen through. Was there an issue with the initial? creative brief um was there an issue getting um were there a lot of comments on those reviews that's something else that might be interesting to see is the um the amount of feedback that's happening are the right people giving feedback are mm -hmm. we not hearing from um the actual um stakeholders that have like the red light green light capabilities until later on are people making like massive changes um and the final versions um, there's just a lot that you could do once you have that data to um, like give you those red flags. So then you can start to really dig in and do your investigative work. 
Yeah, I love it. And I love the idea that it might tie simply to something as simple as the brief or as simple as the way you've configured, chosen the stakeholders review and configured your route. So it sounds like not only do you walk out with a sense of here's what we think the diagnosis is, but more importantly, an actionable, here's what I can do about that. All right. It sounds like maybe you've got another career in medicine coming up, but <laughs> no. I do come out of a medical family. My wife's a nurse, so I do think that way. <laughs> no, I think that I really do love that analogy for this. Cool. And tell me a little bit on one other. I'm sort of curious. How do you think about um, review duration, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. uh, see, that kind of goes back to the initial, like so one of my favorite um, metrics right now. Um, is um, just seeing how stakeholders are giving you feedback, like what their what their process is like. Mm -hmm. Are you waiting a long time on people to actually open up the proofs that you sent them? Are they taking a long time to then submit them back to your designers? Um, and what does long time mean? Like, there's a lot of questions to ask around all that. But um, review duration that can really help keep our stakeholders accountable. Just something mm -hmm. that not really talked about yet is the accountability part of, of metrics and that can kind of feel a little bit sticky sometimes, but um, yeah. But it sounds like you find them useful for accountability and perhaps one reason is they remove the subjectivity. Like you mentioned earlier, it goes from this team never hits its deadline or Bob never submits his review to we understand actually how often that does happen or not. Exactly. Yes, it helps us helps inform the story. Cool. Well, and this actually all goes to really sort of the question here. We have, you know, metrics certainly in the product, whether you're using Litho or not, you should be thinking in terms of that metric framework for metricing your team. How are you doing in each of the four areas? But once you have the metrics, how do you guide customers, how do you guide clients to use those metrics responsibly and to actually make a business difference with them, which is, of course, what we're here to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this slide really ties into what we were just talking about um, around accountability and how to have those sorts of conversations without um, your designers, your people who are actually doing the work, feeling like Big Brother is like watching over their shoulder or micromanaging them. It's gonna make um, having conversations very tense if people are coming into this with a feeling defensiveness. Um, in the same way, um, we've got this bullet point here, help you and your stakeholders get on the same page and hold each other accountable. Accountability can sometimes feel like a double-edged sword. So um, it's really important to, come at this with the understanding of this data is just helping us understand. And we're all on the same team here. Um, and to kind of set the tone with that, um, if people are so, if you're designers, for example, are so focused on um, quick turnaround times, it's difficult for them to get into the flow um, where they can really do their best creative work. So it's, it's hard to strike that balance um, mm -hmm. So it's important at that onset to be able to set a good tone for the conversations that you have with the metrics. I think that's the first thing that you want to think about is the, the tone of the conversation that you have with your team. Mm -hmm. Got a dog in the background who um, gets really excited when he sees the UPS man arrive. So um, don't worry, we don't, we don't happen to hear him. But yes, I, okay, I worry about that in my house as well, Stephanie. It does certainly happen to all of us in this Zoom world that we're in. Um, you were talking a little bit about the tone. How would you guide somebody, a um, leader of a team, if they've not been operating with metrics and they've been sort of, you know, perhaps not measuring things that closely, mm -hmm. And you're coming in with an initiative to measure that team more rigorously. You know, you're right. It can raise distrust. You can go, that's big brother. You can go, I'm being micromanaged. So what is your guidance to someone that is getting tighter on how they metric a team to communicate that? You said, you know, it's essentially build trust, but how do you do that? Yeah, I think one way to do it is through um, quick wins, you know, set, setting the bar really low, helping your, your team feel that they're going to be successful and that success is obtainable for them. You're not um, establishing stretch goals right off 
right off the bat, right? You want your team to have adoption of this. And you, so um, when you're thinking about what goals you're going to set, I would say initially, um, you know, make them comfortable and achievable for everybody. Um, uh, that's one way that you would want to do it. Another thing to think about is everyone wants to know what's in it for them, right? So when you're communicating this to your team, um, it's important not just to throw rules out there without some sort of context um, for why this is important and how it's going to benefit the people on your team. At the end of the day, you're all on the same marketing team together. You're all working for the same company. You want your company to be successful. So how is having a decreased um, period of uh, review duration going to help your entire team be successful? What does that actually mean? And why should people care? So you think through to my personal fav favorite acronym, WIFM, the WIFM, what's in it for me, so that you can communicate this is how it benefits you, right? That's right. Yeah. Cool. Well, I want to take um, one moment to mention that we have coming up for our customers a roundtable on November 18th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Our roundtables, and you know, Stephanie, of course, you've been in them many times, are, they're fun because we get customers together, communicating, collaborating as a community and working directly with us and discussing their wins and challenges. So we're going to have a metrics oriented roundtable on the 18th. Um, you'll get, if you're a customer, you'll get a, an invite to that in the follow up email from this webinar. But I'd heavily encourage you to attend if you're interested, because we've talked a lot here about principles, about frameworks for metrics, about how to think about them and how to use them. But the roundtables are a really nice rubber meets the road opportunity to talk with other people who are um, who are using them. And with that, I'm going to move on to Q&A, and we have actually a really great question from Lindsay here. She's First off, she says, this is fabulous, and thank you, Lindsay, because I do agree with you. But then she's also asking, do you, do you have any recommendations for frequency timing of sharing metrics with stakeholders? Do you think annually, quarterly, monthly? How do you think about that? Um, so there's a, a couple of things that are coming to mind for me right now. One is that um, with the reporting system that we have in like the workflow, um, the reports are live. So you can go in there daily and be able to pull the data. Um, but if you want to do more um, in-depth reporting, um, perhaps a monthly sort of cadence is nice for communicating that with the senior leadership team. Um, maybe monthly, I think with um, the, the challenge I had conducted with my team when I was a customer was a monthly or a weekly cadence. Um, mm -hmm. And then we were going to switch over to uh, monthly after that. So you might, as you're initially launching some sort of um, metrics um, and communication around that, start with a more rigorous cadence and then ease up as you go into it. Nice. That's a, no, that's a really good answer. And it sounds like it's situational because, you know, you mentioned, hey, you're trying to motivate a team to make regular progress. So you, you have that weekly cadence. Monthly might be normal. And I would expect, correct me if I'm wrong, that you might look at these metrics as you do your annual planning as well, mm -hmm. as you're looking ahead to yeah. 2023 and saying, what do I need in terms of resources next year? What can we anticipate in terms of throughput? I would expect this would help you plan for that as well. Yeah. Spoken like a true CMO. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, it is planning season. I am thinking mm -hmm. about that as are yeah. many of us right now. Um, a really good question uh, from Stacy. How long is it reasonable for a proof to remain open? At what point do you say, what is this thing doing sitting out there? Yeah, I think, I mean, like the answer to this is kind of a dissatisfying answer, but it, it depends on what the um, what the situation is. <laughs> if it's, um, um, and, it, and it depends on your team, it depends on the deliverable. So a lot of context there that would help answer that question. Um, I'm trying to think of examples, like if it's a social media post, that's something that's a little bit quicker, maybe for your team, you define that as being 
um, a more quick turnaround time. I would say as you're sending out your proofs for review, just to make sure you're very clear with your stakeholders, what your expectations are on those turn times, if there's deadlines, um, just to be very clear in your communication with the stakeholders up front. That makes sense. It is so often, and I think about this a lot about sort of the discipline of creative operations. Really, what we are is we're sitting at this intersection between the creative team and all the stakeholders and facilitating that. So, yeah, it starts with the stakeholder expectation. But I will say my um, gut response to that one is if we're asking the question, it's probably been too long. So, <laughs> you know, in essence, you know, I, I start a lot of times I manage metrics by exception and it's like, usually this takes a day or two and here's one going on five days. Why is that? Yeah. So that's another way to think about it. Um, Diane's got a question that I know you can answer a lot better than I can. And also I would, you know, encourage you, Diane, join us for the round table if you possibly can. But she's asking a very simple, important question. How do you pull the metrics from Litha? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so there is a reporting feature that's built into LIFO workflow, and it's measuring the data. There's certain data points that come through automatically, such as like when a, um, a project was started. Um, but then there's other data points that you will put in there, such as when a project has been completed. Um, so the metrics are dependent on the, um, the system information. And then also you can create custom fields in LIFO, if there's something specific that you and your team want to measure, a custom field would help um, the system know that that's some data that's important for you. So um, that's uh, it, it's inputted both through the system and through your users. And then once you have the data in your system, you can go to the reports tab and you'll see um, a report there that has just all the, the information in there. You can leave it at that point just so you can glance at it. It looks kind of like a spreadsheet. You can also mm -hmm. export um, Excel files from LIFO if you want to do some further manipulation or formatting of your data. Um, so those are two different ways that you can get metrics from LIFO. And uh, Diane, I would also just underscore what Russ has already said several times that that roundtable, um, as a former customer myself, those roundtables were so valuable just to hear from other customers how they are using the system. Um, the customers that we have at LIFO are just amazing. And I think you'll get some really great ideas there. Awesome. Yeah, I, I learned so much from the community. Um, one, I think this has been a phenomenal conversation, Stephanie, and I've really enjoyed it. One final question, because this one almost lends itself to being a cautionary tale, and it's such a good question. How do you know when you're getting too granular with metrics? This is such a good question. I'm curious to hear what you have to say, Russ. The first thing that comes to mind for me is, um, is are your metrics still answering important questions for you? Are they still um, getting to the concerns that your team members have, the, the people who are on the ground doing the work? Is it still, um, are they still answering the, the questions that your senior leadership team have? Are they um, getting to some of, are there pain points you're trying to resolve or get understanding around? Um, are the metrics actually uh, informing the conversations that you're having? Those are the things that are coming to mind for me, but I'm curious if you have other thoughts for us. Well, that's a good question because I started, I don't know if you know this, but I started my career as a data analyst. And so I spent, you know, days, weeks in playing in data. And to me, there's sort of, I think, a couple things that spring out when you're getting too granular. One is this is going to be really, really silly, but when you forget the question, when you are literally going, okay, this went from 17.3 to 19.2, and we want to get it back to 14.1, and what question are we trying to answer here? And you'd be surprised how often a team can get really heads down in the metrics and forget what is the context, what is the purpose. So that's one place that tells me that, that I might be getting too granular. And the other, and this goes back to your you know, observation, Stephanie, that it all depends on what we do with the data, mm -hmm. is if we are measuring something and no action is ever taken on it. Oh, we measure this, we understand our status here. Okay, are we trying to move that needle and mm -hmm. seeing if it's moving? Or are we watching that as some sort of warning sign? Or are we simply watching it without any other context? So to me, do you know what question you're trying to answer? 
If not, you've got to pull your head out of the weeds, step out of the data and go for a walk and go, what's the question? And then the other is when you say, we measure this routinely and we report on it, and yet no one ever does anything based on it. So those are my sort of thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephanie, we've talked about the roundtable coming up the 18th. I do hope people can join us. Do you have any final words of wisdom to leave people with? Because I know that many teams you know, on this webinar are at different points of sophistication. Some may be very well metriced and running very rigorously. Some may be saying, this is area, an area I need to go into. Any final words of wisdom or guidance, regardless of where people might be on that spectrum? Um, I think the main thing that's coming up for me is uh, just going back to the round table, I'm seeing a couple more questions from people in the, um, the Q&A chat. Uh, Stacy has a question about success around the proof expire feature. Um, and then there's an anonymous question about a popular metric that we've not found to be very helpful. And these are such practical questions. I think that that um, that round table is gonna be really helpful for folks. Um, as to the, the proofing expire feature, it sounds like Stacy is having some issues keeping her stakeholders accountable. So mm -hmm. maybe having some of the metrics around um, like how long stakeholders are taking to submit their reviews, that might be helpful information to share with your stakeholders um, to have sort of a, maybe a conversation with them at large and um, talk with them about some of the issues that like your team, your creative teams are facing and like come with the numbers to then have a, a talk with them. Um, and I know I see Sonia's question in the chat about how to sign up for the round table. Um, so uh, how, how can folks sign up for their own table? It's a great question. In the follow-up email from this, um, the follow-up email to customers, you'll get a link to sign up for the round table. So they have the ability to just click and sign up. So uh, that should that should be pretty easy. Um, the and I just want to highlight that what you were just mentioning about the proof expiration for Stacy that this is actually sort of the use case that you talked about early on with your favorite metrics in terms of what is the amount of time that it's out what is essentially your what was the flow again you had a flow of yeah so in your in your report we can set up a column and the this is this is um data that will flow through automatically from the system um but there's a column for a reviewer invited, reviewer opened. So that means when the reviewer has actually opened the proof and then reviewer submitted. So that shows when they've submitted their comments. And then you can see in three different columns um, how long it's taken for someone to receive the invitation to review and leave their feedback to how long it's taken them to um, actually finish giving their feedback and sending it back to you. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that helped. And so that helps you manage them and convey their accountability. So that makes yeah, good sense. Exactly. But I do love that um, final question you mentioned. What's a popular metric that you found not very helpful? Mm. See, that one is interesting. Like nothing is coming to mind off the, the top of my head right now. Um, is there something for you, Russ, that over the years as being a CMO that you found maybe to be helpful at one point, but not so much anymore? That's a good question. I mean, in this context, well, I say context, I think it all comes down to context. Generally, when metrics are useless, it's because you're using them in the wrong context. So let's use, for example, you know, review duration as an aggregate number that's really, really useful to know sort of your trends. And as you said, longitudinally, is it trending up? Is it trending down? But when you drill in, and this also gets to the, when you're getting to granular level, different projects are different sizes. They have different levels of rigor, different numbers of stakeholders involved for you know, a website redesign versus a social media post. So comparing those as though they're apples to apples you do need a little bit of the context. So if you find, for example, that overall it looks like efficiency is slowing, you need to drill in and see the context. It may not be that efficiency is slowing. It may be that you have a few very large projects, whereas the month before you had a much larger number of very small projects. So, I mean, I'm sure I could come up with any 
number of metrics that I would go, I'm not sure why people measure this. But for me, most things that people measure, if you understand the context and use it appropriately, can be valuable. Oh, but Twitter followers. Okay, that's a useless metric. You want a useless metric? There's your useless metric. So. <laughs> Um, well, Stephanie, thank you again for your time. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. This was, I thought, a phenomenal conversation. I had fun. And um, you will be getting a recording of the webinar. You will be getting, if you're a customer, an invite to that roundtable. And I'd like to thank you all once again. And Stephanie, thank you. Yeah, it's been great, Russ. Thank you. All right.